Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I welcome you to St. Andrews United Methodist Church, Virginia Beach. I'm Pastor Witt. Hope you've had a great week. Uh, this is the 15th Sunday in Pentecost or after Pentecost or in Kingdom Tide, uh, year A, and um, September 10th. We're going to talk about what is the sign? What is the sign? We have two very familiar passages, uh, an Old Testament in Exodus and a New Testament in Matthew. And um, I don't know. We'll see. I'm hopefully going to dig up some stuff for you to sift through this week and, and see if it has some bearing on your, um, on your spiritual reality, on your life, on your walk with Christ uh, as you, you are a disciple of Jesus. Um, we got some some new folks that are teaching Sunday school. Thank you uh, to Linda and Dave. Um, we got some new people, Jackie, that are going to be working with the kids. Um, this Wednesday, we have the kickoff of what we are calling Wednesday Evening Fellowship Fun Food and Discussions of Faith. Uh, starts at 6 o'clock with dinner in the Fellowship Hall and then at 6.30. All the different groups, the Puppets of Praise, the Children's Choir, the Adult Bible Study, all those things will take place at 6.30. Um, come. If you just want to come and fellowship and have something to eat and be on your way, that's okay. Come. It's it's a midweek for us to be able to, uh, to spend a little time in relationship developing and then faith development. Um, Thank you for your donations to the church. Uh, it's summertime. I say that each week. We are in need of, you know, still kicking it up a bit. But it's just now September, and that's the way it works. Um, Jackie, um, excuse me, Terry is going to begin a new thing where... Every two weeks, she's going to say that we're going to be concentrating on socks, or we're going to be concentrating on nail files, or we're going to be con so that we can put together our blessing bags. You know, as we begin to move into the fall and then into the winter, uh, folks around us are more and more in need. And so, do what it is that God calls you to do. Ask God and, and have at it. I think that's all that I wanted to touch on at this point for for the beginning of a service. Why don't we take a couple seconds to center ourselves on Jesus and then we'll begin with our call and scripture and such. Let's pray.
Now hear the call to worship and invocation. Pilgrims on the way, when we feel lost and ask for a sign to show us the way out of our confusion, we remember that when we gather to worship, we find God in our midst. When we face obstacles and barriers that keep us from the life God has called us to, we remember that God is always at work among us, protecting and tending our well-being. When we cannot find our way out of conflict and discord, we remember that God calls and equips us for the work of reconciliation. When we struggle to pay attention to how God is at work all around us, we remember God's call to sit, eat, and tell one another the story of God's faithfulness. Pilgrims on the way, when we watch for signs of God among us, let us remember that we too are signs of God's presence for others. When we pray for the church and for the world, we lock into the loving things God wants for humanity. Let us pray. Loving God, friend of the neglected and the despised folk, friend also of the cherished and honored ones, we offer to you our prayers for this world for which Christ gave his all. We pray for the overflow of the arrogant and cruel, and for the discontent in the souls of the greedy and the careless. We pray for the uplifting of the meek and merciful, and for the encouragement of the poor and pure. We pray for the recovery of the bruised and the lost, and the peace of those who thirst for righteousness. We pray for the feeding of the hungry in body and spirit, and for the healing of those who are diseased in body or mind. We pray for the comfort of the suffering and the grieving, and for the befriending of the lonely, timid, or socially awkward people. We pray for the humbling of the church if it becomes proud, and for the courage whenever it is shunned or persecuted. We pray for the strong and the weak in this congregation, and for the spiritual health of all other churches in the community. You, holy friend, are more eager to give than we are to receive. Deal firmly with your servants gathered here now, that we get rid of everything that clutters our souls and make way for all the new blessings you have in store for us. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. pray for illumination. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, open for us your written word. Holy Spirit, come and attach to these spoken words and make them become living experiences for us, so that we may hear a renewed message from you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, 
it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments, as I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The Matthean text is Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. If you're not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Listen truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by your Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered, in my name, I am there among them. Again, the written word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. You know, God saved the Hebrews from a terrible disease that came over the land of Egypt. The oldest boy child in each family died as a result of this disease. But God promised the Hebrews that their children would not die. Each family would eat a specially prepared lamb meal and then put the blood from the lamb on the doorposts. And this marked the houses where God was present and these houses would be passed over. The sons in those houses would not die. This tenth plague was the plague that finally forced Pharaoh to let the Hebrew people go free. Have you ever tried to look for a sign of God's presence? And how can we be a sign of God's presence? The next time you're in the church, I invite you to go into the worship center. It's filled with signs of God's presence and symbols of Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. I invite you to look around and see how many of them you can find in that space. When we look around in our daily lives, we see signs everywhere. We see traffic signs. We see signs that label um, classrooms. We see signs that give us information about where to go. And we see a sign that identifies this building as our church and what time worship services are. When we see someone waving at us, that's a sign that they have seen it. It's a greeting. Signs give us direction. They tell us which way to go. They may sermon title is what is the sign it's in the series of uh, the journey begins what is the sign let us pray father I ask that through the power of your spirit you would come and remove my words and somehow place your meaning your words where I speak and may all hear what they need to hear directly from you even if it's a variant uh, a variant message for each of us. Speak to us in a way that we can receive it. Help us to, to place it inside our beings and become better about being your disciple in this world. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now I have to tell you, we're faced with two very, very different scriptures here. Um, they may even be contradictory to one another. I'd, I have wrestled with these this week rather significantly. Uh, I have a couple of buddies that I talk with in getting ready for sermons. I have a stack of books that I read. Um, when I was looking at these two, I, I'll tell you, an easier way of dealing with the lectionary is not to deal with two pieces of scripture. but. If I believe, as I do, that there is a commonality to the message that exists and flows through the Bible, then I should be able to, as I discuss things with you, come to a way of reconciling messages which may seem contradictory, as I said, to one another. And I think I found that to be true this week. It may seem contradictory, but they're not. The Exodus story is a story of God's beginning with the Israelites. It's not a story of the beginning of the world. 
It's not a story of working with people who were ancestors to the Israelites. It's a story of God beginning with the Israelites. Uh, let me say to you that I believe that God created. I believe that God created all people. I believe that, that God worked with Abraham, with Jacob, with Joseph, with these different folks that are the precursors for this moment where I say that God begins with the Israelites. And having said that, I'm not saying that there weren't workings of God with those peoples before, that people before, but it's at this moment that God comes into human history and does something very, very different and very special with these people and begins a relationship with the Israelites. And he makes it very clear that this relationship is not the same relationship that he has with other people. I want to say to you that that if you were to read the book of Genesis, and uh, yes, Jackie, Genesis is my favorite book, um, next to Exodus, next to John. Um, but Genesis is is a time of explaining how humanity got off on the wrong foot. As someone say to me, what's Exodus? It's an explanation of how humanity got off on the wrong foot, how it chose to do its own thing, how sin came into the world and the repercussions that sin brought into the world. And if someone were to say to me, well, what is Exodus? I would say, Exodus is a book which is an explanation of how God is now trying to get back into the story and scoop out a people and begin to speak to that people a message so that way down the line, a guy named Jesus could come through that people and speak another step in the message. Yes, I said that there seems to be an incremental understanding about God and who God is, and that, that as we move through the Bible, particularly through the Pentateuch, uh, and then the New Testament, we do hear of a God well, we do hear of a human's understanding about what and who God is and what relationship those people have had with God. Um, that may create some angst for some of you. Uh, if it does, give me a call. We'll sit down and we'll talk about it. But I think Exodus is the story of God's beginning with the people of Israel to call them out as a people and to begin to mold them and work on them and make them become something that God needs in order to help people return back to relationship with God, back to relationship with themselves, back to relationship with others, back to their relationship with creation, the ones that God defined in the beginning. Doc Kinney talked about that um, on a regular basis uh, in my mind. That the relationships that were destroyed in the garden was the relationship with self, me to me, relationship with others, me to others, relationship with creation, me to creation, and relationship with me to God. And that this happened with all individuals. The sinful nature of humanity passes this down. Difficult as it is to look at a baby and to think that they're sinful, my theology, my understanding is that when my little girl, when my little boy came into the world, there was already original sin on them. The Exodus story, well, it did. Matthew is a story of God's beginning with the church. If Exodus is a story of God's beginning with the Israelites, Matthew is a story about God's beginning with the church. Um two separate identities and I'm going to to theorize with you maybe even two separate kind of focuses on theology. We're going to talk about that. Exodus story presents us with a God with God's method of uh, of freeing or what I call prying the Israelites out of the hand of the Egyptians and building a people into um, a community, developing a community and a relationship with the people 
and with themselves. You say, well, didn't they have that? No, they didn't. Um, in fact, if you'll go back and actually read what took place prior to this, you'll find that well, you, even when Moses went and um, remember we talked about the burning bush last week and Moses gets this thing and he goes to the people and he says, Moses said, well, who am I supposed to say sent me? And he said, tell them is sent you. I am. Tell them I am sent you. The guy that is sent you. The, the God that is. This is a very new principle. Um, if the Israelites um, bring us any kind of a new thing into the world about God, it is monotheism. There were, there were lots of religions and they were they had lots of gods and this monotheistic understanding of God that there is one God, one creator, one redeemer, one sustainer, one father, one son, one Holy Spirit, all one that, that comes into existence after Jesus a few hundred years, the theology comes into existence. I believe that the revelation is there. It's just that folks don't pick, you know, we're not very good at picking things up sometimes. But Exodus presents us with God's method for freeing or prying the Israelites out of the hand of the Egyptians. Uh, in talking with one of my colleagues this week, I said, you know, whenever I read this Old Testament stuff, it becomes very difficult for me. Um, this thing of watching God telling the Israelites how to free themselves. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff before this. You may want to go read some of it. The the plagues and things that had. This is the final confrontation between the power structure of Egypt and the power structure of God. You'll notice that the people don't have anything to do with it. The only Their participants but they're only actors in the play in so much as they do what God asked them to do and then because of the asking God protects them. I want to stop here for a second and make sure that you understand this clearly because I think this is a part of what we as Christians need to understand. There seems to be this thought process that God's a vending machine, that we just simply reach out our hand and take what we want. I do not understand that to be the case. I understand that there is this thing where God proffers and then we respond and we receive the blessing and God proffers and we respond over and over and over. The grace that we receive is not something that we reach and grab. It's something that Jesus has already extended to us. The Israelites have to receive what has been extended to them, the Passover. If they refuse to put the blood on the doorposts and the lentils, they're not going to be saved. Now, lest you think this is just a, a really simple thing, I want to tell you that it is not. Uh, by their putting the, the blood on their doorposts and their lentils, they are actually, you know... If they were wrong, if Moses was wrong, the next morning there'd be knocks on the doors and soldiers, Egyptian soldiers, standing outside with knives ready to kill the families of these people. This is not a small thing. This is a step of faith. I'm not sure that we ever really see it that way. But this is a step of faith that, that the Israelites are, are putting out there. They're, they're signing the Declaration of Independence. They're putting their name to their doorposts, to their lentils. And this is God's method for freeing, or as I say, prying the Israelites out of the hand of their captors, the Egyptians. Make no mistakes, the Egyptians did not want these guys to go free. They wanted these men, these women, these children to stay working for them. Um... <laughs> I don't want to chase this rabbit too far, but I want to say to you that the slavery is alive and well today. It's alive and well today. Um, most of us would not consider ourselves to be slaves, but I tell you that in my mind, most of us are, if not all. We are slaves to prosperity. We are slaves to 
um, to the, the brass ring. We are slaves to beauty. We are slaves to to wanting the best and the newest of these. We are slaves to wanting cars that are certain ways, houses that are certain ways, um, shoes. I was talking with a friend of mine the other day, and he said that his kid wanted a thousand dollar shoe. And I said, you got to be kidding me, a grand for a pair of shoes. He said, yeah. I said, what'd you do? He said, I bought them. I said, why? He said, because I didn't want him to go to school and feel like an outcast. <laughs> I thought, oh, Lord. We are slaves. Um, this is the method that God uses to free, to pry the Israelites out of the hand of the Egyptians. Because it takes... It takes an act of faith on the part of the Egyptians to make this thing come true. Um, and it's not that God wants to free them and to turn them loose. God wants to free them so that he can make a community of them and make a people of them. Now i got to tell you, all you got to do is just read the Bible and you hear over and over where this people wants to maintain its individualism. And one need but read the rest of the Old Testament to find the great fractions that take place between these different peoples, these different families, and then later on, the two southern tribes taking up a way of thinking, and the northern tribes, the ten northern tribes, when they get to Israel, taking up their thinking, and dividing out, and they lose their power. Let me say to you that if you are ever in the business of division or subtraction, you have just entered the adversary's way of dealing with the world. God is the opposite. And you say to me, "Well, wait." And here's the issue: you say to me, "Well, wait a second. We're taking looking. Uh, we're looking at a at a particular story where God is separating folks out from the Egyptians." And this is a subtraction or a division. And I would say to you, it absolutely is. It absolutely is. What they were going through was brutal. What they were going through was visceral. It was earthy. It was... And God needed to find a way to break into this power structure of the world and pry out a small remnant so that God could begin to work with that small remnant through history. And all you need to do is to read history to see how this small remnant of people has been treated. Now, I'm not saying they're the only ones that have been treated poorly. But they sure have been. And over and over, God has had to rescue them. And I don't have time. You know the stories. You know the stories how God pairs down an army to a handful of people and sends them into battle where, where God walks people around uh, walls and shouts at it. Um, over and over, God moves this people forward trying to make it cohesive and be able to speak into it. Ruha, blow into it the Spirit of God to make it one so that it can move through history and over time, it becomes the one that brings us Jesus. Well, the Matthean story, if, if the Exodus story presents us a method for freeing the Israelites and for building relationship and community, the Matthean story presents us with God's method for building community and relationship. Insisting that community is the way. The binding together of people is the way. Um, when we look at this story where Jesus says, Hey, look, if you're in conflict with somebody, go and talk and try and work it out. I found that to, to not work very well over the years, but it has been something I've tried to do. You know, to send a text and say, Hey, give me a call. Um, when you can't get through. Call somebody and say, hey, let's sit down and have a coffee and talk about this thing. Um, it, it works occasionally, but not real well. Uh, usually when you get to the point where you have two people talking in the midst of this thing, where you have another person, another one or two people, and you're, you're trying to get at these issues, these things, trying to iron them, iron them out, that works a little better. 
Um, the third aspect of this, where if you can't get it worked out there, you're supposed to take it to the church or to the body to work it out. Whew. Boy, when you get to that point, you really have something that's uh, better be pretty daggone heavy in order to carry it out there. In my first church, I had a guy who was misrepresenting uh, what was going on while we were trying to put a heating system, an air conditioning system in the church. And um, I found out just through happenstance that, that he had been um, not sharing <laughs> forth, he was not forthwith with the information that was coming from the company that had designed the system for us. And uh, I called him up and I said, hey, look, you're going to need to come to the administrative board, the council on ministry. You're going to need to explain to these people that what we've been told for the past 6, 8, 10, 12, 15 months, I don't remember, is incorrect. That they've been ready to go. They've been waiting on us. And you've been telling us that they were not ready to give us a figure on this thing. And um, he hung up the phone and so I called his best buddy that happened to be a buddy of mine and I said hey we need to go by and see this guy and see if we can get this thing reconciled because this is a big deal and I'm not interested in losing this guy but rather I'm interested in trying to find a way of reconciliation now what what I find interesting in is oftentimes people don't want to reconcile they don't want to come to you they don't want to talk about it they will talk around you. They will talk behind your back. They will, and when you offer that thing of saying, "Let's sit down and talk," it becomes a very difficult thing for folks to do. When we went and sat down with him, uh, he said no. His wife said, "Please." He said, "No, I won't do it. I won't do it." And so the two of them ended up leaving the church. We did end up getting the full project done and stuff. But interesting to me, uh, Elizabeth and I, my wife and I, saw him at annual conference 20, 25 years later, uh, 20 years later. And um, he walked up and shook my hand and asked how I was doing. And I thought, that's very interesting. Um, and I had a nice conversation with him. Had no problems with him personally. I simply had a problem with him lying to the congregation, to the church. And I just wanted him to simply, I would have had no problems if he came in and said, Look, I was worried about this thing financially, and all I wanted to do was just slow it down until we have more, or whatever. And I'd have been fine. And if he'd have said, Hey, I'm sorry, that would have been the end of it. For me, I have that kind of personality. When you say to me, I'm sorry, you know, I really. I stepped out and said something, I did something that I shouldn't have done, then for me it's over. You know, I, I let it go. Um, I'm pretty easy to do the same thing with people, to, to apologize toward people whenever I, you know, am confronted with where I've, you know, gone too far. Uh, I'm human. <laughs> I go too far. I have testosterone. You know, that's why I tell you I need to go 1001, 1002, 1003. I'm thinking. 2004, 1005, 1006. I'm starting to find my right mind. 1007, 1008, 1009, 1010. Okay, now we can move forward. These two stories are very different. The Exodus story begins uh, a conversation, a relationship with the Israelites, moves them into community. They're a very fragmented people. This thing that happens in the uh, Sinai Peninsula, which we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks, um, it's really an amazing thing that God pulls these guys, these men, these women, these children, these animals, pulls them out of Egypt, moves them through the barrier of the water, the Reed Sea, um, and then into the Sinai Peninsula, which no people can exist on their own easily there. And God feeds them and God waters them. And more than that, God forces them to rely on each other and to understand what it is to have leadership. I'll tell you, we're in a place today where leadership is not well thought of by much of anybody. Um, that's problematic. We're similar to to those folks out in the uh, out in the desert and then finally God brings them some order um, I was talking with with a buddy of mine this week uh, about this and I said you know 
when I look at those commandments, which we'll be talking about in, in another week or so, um, it reminds me of children. I don't know about you, but when uh, my children were coming along, they got to be about one and a half, two, three, somewhere in there. They went into what they called the no stage. No, no, no. Where they tried to exert their independence, <clears throat> their, well, their own being. But even more than that, I think a part of what's happening is they've heard no so many times that they begin to utilize that word to talk with other people. And the Israelites, without a doubt, heard this word over and over and over. Do we move forward? No. Do we collect more manna than one day? No. Just one day, six days, and then two days worth on that day so you don't have to collect it on the seventh day do we offer oh, this no 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 thou shalt have no other gods before me thou shalt not miss you there's this prohibition that's placed over and I, and I sort of see the Israelites as these people that had been under the oppression of of the Egyptians and are now being freed and now what's going to happen is if there's nothing that structures them, they're going to run amok. And boy, do they. Um, and God has to restructure them and pull them back into relationship. Now, when I go to the Matthean story and I begin to read it, the Matthew story, you know, I hear a story where God's beginning the church. By the way, in the Gospels, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, there's only two mentions of church. And it's right here, very close to one another here. So only two mentions of the church. Yes, I am well aware that in the epistles and in Revelation, there's a lot of discussion. But in the Gospels, there's only two. I think what Jesus is doing is Jesus is presenting a method for building community and relationships. And he's insisting that these relationships be preeminent to your own needs. So I would say to you um, that we as Christians have an obligation to try and make things right with other people. We don't have an obligation to make things right. We have an obligation to try and make things right. But in my experience, most people don't want to talk. They don't want to. Okay, fine. But we have an obligation to, if they desire to sit down and to talk and to try and work things out, we have an obligation to do this. I, I really irritated a buddy of mine uh, one time when I said, I was really quite irritated with Bush, uh, Bush Jr. Um, when Yasser Arafat became the leader of Palestine and he stepped on TV and made some really pejorative comments about him and about his regime. And I said to my buddy, I really wish what he had done is that he had gotten in the same room with him and shook his hand, went out on the, the you know, outside on the thing, they waved at each other, they shook each other's hand, they went back inside, and then he said the things that he said to the world to that guy face to face. Um, I wish he would have said to the world, okay, this is your leader, this is the person that you elected. Congratulations for your election. Let's see if we can get along. Then gone back behind the room, the, the walls, and said, now let me be clear, you mess up and it's not going to be any good for you. And then gone back out and waved and shook hands. Because in my mind, that's what a leader would have done, would have been trying to build some type of a relationship and in my mind in that instance what he did was uh, he drove a wedge between us and many peoples around the world why do i tell you this not to irritate you if you liked him or like the situation or think i'm an idiot fine whatever i don't care um what i want you to hear me saying is that i think we have an obligation to find ways to build community we have an obligation 
even with people. I had a good buddy of mine that I spoke with some, it's been two or three years ago, and, and he was really off in a political direction, and I was talking about the other person, and um, I said to me, are you telling me that this person has done nothing good? And he said, yeah, absolutely nothing. I said, then I can't trust what comes out of your mouth. And he was shocked. And I said, if you can tell me nothing that this person has ever done of any value, nothing, and you're telling me that nothing of value has been done by this man, well, then I can't trust you. If you can tell me some of the things that he's done that has been good, and then I'll be glad to listen to the elaboration of the things where he's done poor things. This is the way we build relationship, by being honest and sitting down and talking, by lying and cheating and stealing and bending the rules. This is not how we build community. The church, in my estimation, in recent years, has been bending its own rules, and in doing so, it's been fracturing people off to go elsewhere. When what we needed to do, in my estimation, is to follow our rules, and if we don't like the rules, to change the rules. And if we don't like the rules and we can't get them changed, then go somewhere else. But to break rules, to break relationships. Um, tell me what marriage continues well, where people break the rules, break the covenants that have been made. Our God has made a covenant with us. I believe that Jesus wants us to build communities and relationships. Jesus has attempted to, to make a relationship with us now, let me close with this, and this is much longer than I really wanted to talk, but there is for me a very interesting dynamic of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I want to say to you that I think there is a theological development about our understanding of who and what God is. Um, Jesus said, you have heard it said such and such, but I tell you. You have heard it said such and such, but I tell you. You have heard it said such and such, but I tell you, one thing cannot exist. It cannot exist that God has changed God's mind about things over time. I have a buddy who believes that, that, that God is, it's called progressive theology. Um, I reject it. Um, I believe that God knows who God is, what God wants. God may work with us, but I don't think that God changes the real dimensions of who and what God is. Having said that, how then do we explain this Old Testament thing of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and Jesus saying, forgive, 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 forgive. Those are two very different understandings coming from the same being. If Jesus is God, how can this possibly be? I believe that there is a continual uh, updating of humanity's understanding about who and what God is. And if that's the case, then Jesus is presenting us with some really upgraded stuff here in the Matthean text where we are to do all we can to build relationship. I'll close with this. Addition, multiplication, God. Subtraction, division, adversary. Those on the inside were offered great things. Those on the outside were offered ways to the inside. Go and scratch your head on this stuff. If you want to talk, give me a call. God bless you. May the Lord, may he open you to some new ways of thinking that will benefit you and others. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all those who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and before one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We've rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord.
Amen. Would you join me in praying silently for our sins? Hear the good news, the gospel. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Generous God, give thanks for all you have given us. We return from it an offering for the sake of spreading love as the body of Christ. Open us, Lord, to even better ways to steward your creation under our care. Help us to aid you and bring your kingdom to the world. In the name of Christ Jesus, we offer this prayer. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. 
You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. The night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he raised it, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took a cup. He raised it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, O oh Lord, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, O Lord, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church, honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Lord, make this be a means of grace for us, a place where we find your holy presence. Make this be for us a sign and a symbol of your sacrifice and a call for ours. You may receive your elements. Go into the world empowered by the Spirit of God and be people of God who are reaching out and trying to repair relationships as best you can. Go and do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May you be a blessing to yourself and others. Mm -hmm.